Hello, I'm a massive Star Trek fan. I've always enjoyed Star Trek. I like to pick stuff up about it. Phasers, communicators. Um, always had a great, always had great fun with Star Trek. I've even got this baby, which I was my wife got me as a Christmas present. Absolutely beautiful. Look at that, isn't she beautiful? All the moving sounds and everything. Big fan of the original series. Um, bigger fan of the next generation, especially Deep Space Nine, which is my favourite Star Trek. My favourite Enterprise is the refit model from the movies, from the first movies. Um, uh, I think she's just beautiful. I absolutely, absolutely adore her. So yeah, I've always had great fun with Star Trek. Uh, I even had a go at the role-playing games. So picked up the Star Trek role-playing game, which is the Games Workshop Edition, second edition. And I've also got the Star Trek Three tactical combat system in here as well. And a few years later, because we were playing um, Task Force games, Starfleet Battles, uh, picked up Prime Directive. Uh, which is a good little system, good little game. I ended up using the character sheets and converted it using the D6 system because we were all playing the D6 system at the time, so it was just easier. Uh, I've actually got the document somewhere. I might try and link it if I can. So really simple uh, conversion between that system. Well, not even a conversion. Basically, I was just using the character sheet um, in, the, in that game uh, on the D6 system. Uh, and then the next version of Star Trek kind of passed me by, the, uh, the role-playing game. And I've got the new Modifius one, Star Trek Adventures, uh, which is really, really good. The really works really well with the two T20 system, and the second edition coming out. So uh, I'll be getting that. Uh, I'll be getting that, no doubt, when it comes out. Hopefully, get a campaign out of it. But anyway, yeah, I've always enjoyed Star Trek. I've enjoyed all the shows. Uh, Deep Space Nine is my favourite. Um, I'm, I'm even enjoying parts of what they're doing at the moment, especially with Strange New Worlds, which is really good. Uh, but one place where I won't say I've failed, but where I've struggled is with the role playing games even though I've got these and I've really really enjoyed them and we played them and had a great time about them I've always struggled because the people that I was playing the role playing games with knew more about Star Trek than I did now I I know a lot about Star Trek um, but I don't know the like, the real details the real lore I couldn't name episodes just by looking at a clip uh, I couldn't talk about the backgrounds of characters certain characters that crop up every now and then so as much as I love Star Trek, I, you know that, that amount of detail is lost on me. So when I was trying to run Star Trek games, because the players knew more about Star Trek than I did, they were talking about things and saying things or wanting to do things that I really had no knowledge of or wasn't 100% sure about. So I ended up spending a lot of time saying, yeah, sure, you can do that. Or really? OK, then, yeah, you can have that. Uh, there was one instance where they were getting into a bit of difficulty and then one of the characters said, OK, then I'll pat him on the back and as I do, I'll put a Viridian patch on him. And I had no idea what he was talking about, uh, at the time anyway. Um, and then he explained what it did. It's like a tracker, you put it on. It's from Star Trek Six. You see, um, well, I won't actually go into any plot details in case you've not seen it. But yeah, they use it in, in Star Trek Six. This, this little patch and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, <laughs> So I didn't really know what he was talking about. It wasn't until later on that uh, what I was explained what it did, even though I'd, I'd already said that you could use it. And then I suddenly realised, oh, God, yeah, it's that thing from Star Trek Six. And then I realised what it was capable of. And it kind of didn't scupper my game, but it made it a bit more difficult for me. It made it too easy for the PCs. The game would have been over in no time uh, because they used this patch. So I allowed it to ride at that point. Uh, but then I had to make a ruling at the end of the game saying you don't just walk around. Starfleet officers don't just walk around with Rudian patches in the pocket. They can't just pull one out every time it's convenient. Um, and it was convenient quite a lot. Um, and then there was discussions about certain ways the transporters worked, to where they could beam and how they could beam and whether it could beam through shields. And, and in the end, the games fell apart not because they were bad games, but because there was just so much conversation about what was and wasn't possible. We spent more time talking about the lore and the uh, the setting of Star Trek and what was possible, what wasn't possible, uh, what characters could do, what they knew, uh, or what they know, um, and it just became it, everything became a talking point. Um, and when that happens, the game stops being about experience in the Star Trek universe. It stops being about playing in the Star Trek universe, and it becomes more about the universe itself. So we might as well just be sitting around having a conversation about Star Trek which I'm absolutely fine with, because I learnt a few things as well. But as a GM, you really got to be on top, top of things as far as the setting's concerned. I'm not saying you need to know more than the players, even though that would be an absolute massive benefit, but you need to know just about as much, or you all need to be on the same page as far as um, the setting's concerned. So, so, so what I'm talking about is when you're running a role-playing game, whether it's Star Trek or something else completely, 
if the players know more than you do, it's going to make your job more difficult as a GM because what what we ended up doing with Star Trek was that I was saying to them, okay, then you told me that it's going to affect the game somewhat, so I'm going to say no for now, and then at the end of the game we'll discuss it. And you can't do that every single session because you're going to spend a lot of time saying no to stuff. So they're going to come up with this fantastic idea because of something they saw in um, episode seven, season three. And then they're going to say, actually, let's try this, this, and this. And because I don't remember that that season, or I don't remember that aspect of the setting, I'm automatically going to say, actually, no. Because I don't know if you're making it up. You, you could have just literally spouted two minutes of crap, and I've fallen for it because you want a bonus on your roll. Or you want to automatically succeed. you know, Or you want to make your life easier for yourself. I'm not saying that every single player does that, although I have known it to happen. But unfortunately, as GM, you've got to be aware that you could have, you, you know, they could be fooling you. You know, you could you could have been fooled into into believing that this was happening in that setting, or this was possible, or the, 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 those particular characters have that ability. So yeah, so I think what I'm trying to say is, when you go into a role playing game, any role playing setting whatsoever, you need to know what it is that you're doing as the GM. This is why, and we go back to this. This is why I like rules light games, because then quite a lot of it is based on, on knowledge and not what's in the book. So, and, and a lot of stuff can be done on the fly, which suits the game. I love narrative games for that very, very reason. Uh, but sometimes, uh, mechanically or even just sort of lore-wise, it can kind of mess with the idea that you've got in your head for the actual game itself. It can either send it off track or it could make you change course completely because something's happened or they said something to you about the lore and the setting that you knew nothing about and it's turned the entire game on its head. And that kind of was also flip side because if you're a player, if I was a player and I knew a lot about this setting and I was playing away and that GM didn't seem to know a lot and I was being told no all the time or I'm not sure about that, let's leave it till next time or hmm, we'll have to make a roll or it comes to a ruling which I don't think is fair because I know what I'm talking about in that setting that as a player that would make me feel a little bit cheated because I know that about the setting, I know that about the law, I know that about characters and I know that about what's happening in that world me knowing that and then being told, well, actually, no, will kind of ruin the experience for me. So th there is a lot of pressure on GMs to, to know everything on the games, rules-wise, setting-wise, law-wise. And I get that. I really, really do. And there are some times where you are going to have to step back and say, do you know what, actually, um, I'm, I'm going to have to say no to that for now. Or well, no, let's, let's look a bit more deeper into this and we'll make, we'll make a decision uh, later on. Um, and yeah, it, it can disrupt a game, and, it can, and like I say, it can put a lot of pressure on on, on GMs. Uh, this is I, I made a video recently about session zero, and I think that's why session zero is important, so that everybody knows where they are and what they're doing and what's expected of them. And I think part of that is also what they know about the game that they're playing, uh, not only the rules system, but of course the setting setting as well. So. Um, so I think it's a lot, a lot easier today uh, because we've got the internet. So I'm sat there, the, the other day actually, um, I was sat there on my phone because somebody asked a question and I wasn't 100% sure of the answer. So straight on the phone, beep, 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 beep. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right, let's do that. Or, or actually it doesn't say, quite say that here, so I'm gonna make this warning. So the internet has made like, people's lives, GM's lives, infinitely easier because now you can look things up pretty quickly. Um, however, back then, back when I was gaming, um, we didn't have that luxury, so we had to rely on people being honest, or we had to rely on people knowing what they were talking about uh, to actually um, to actually get anywhere. So, uh, so yeah, so I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. So, so yeah, so basically, what it comes down to is know your setting, um, know as much as or more than the players at the table, if you possibly can, uh, at least come to an agreement if that's the case, because there's no point in you going into a game and you basically don't know the setting or knowing a lot about the setting that you're playing in because that's going to be a little bit annoying for you as a GM and stressful and it's going to make the players feel a little bit cheated as well. So uh, so yeah, so I think that's it for that one. Uh, thanks very much. Ta-ra.